Most of us would agree it is awful when an individual unknowingly signs a predatory loan contract and ends up paying far more in the future than they initially expected. Even if this doesn't bankrupt them, this is still incredibly detrimental. You may believe people playing a free-to-play video game is trivial, but the financial damage they face is not. Three arguments are forward. Firstly, how we prevent exploitation. Secondly, when we get fairer gameplay. Lastly, how we reduce addiction. Before that, setup. One, what are the incentives of gaming companies? We say most firms are profit maximum but have different revenue models. This debate is about which profit models companies would use. We see for free to play games, they have to make the game as addictive as possible to the extent that individuals are willing to put in real cash. Companies like Epic have entire departments dedicated to exacerbating addiction by working with psychologists. Compared to free to play, uh, compared to free games right now or one-time pay games, we say they often earn their money through either getting the upfront cost of the game, of the, uh, downloading the app or through advertising and attracting many players who, who, who can play and pay the upfront cost. Second question, what is the current market of free-to-play games? We say there's a current market dominance. Look at the most popular games right now. League of Legends, Fortnite, Genshin, Brawl Stars, Clash Royale. These are becoming incredibly profitable, and therefore many new games are also transitioning to this model. Third question, how do we ban free-to-play games on our side? We say we would stop them, we would stop new ones from existing. Companies would have to change their profit structures. For the current games that exist, developers would make new players pay an upfront cost of these starts. For existing players, they just get to play the games, but they can no longer buy things like upfront. What is this? But this, however, doesn't mean that we suddenly lose half the games on the market, but those games probably adapt to non free to play models. Fourthly, what is our preferred comparative? We prefer games to be either free or have a one time cost when you download the app. Realistically, we agree not a lot of these games will be free, but we will argue that games are still more accessible and less costly on our side. First argument how do we prevent exploitation? When gamblers entice you with supposed low cost until they trap you in a cycle of addiction, that is unjust. The first question under this is how does exploitation occur with the free to play? gaming model. We say when you enter the game, you often view the cost to be pretty low. It is actually free. You see your friends playing the game. You think it might be worth a try. You therefore download it. Even if you are aware of the payment level ups in the future, you feel as if you're not going to get that get that addicted. That is not going to be you. Then you won't be needing to make these payments. But as you start playing more, often subconsciously, when your friends are also hooked onto it, it is more likely individuals commit far more time and effort into this game. Here's when the costs start to gradually kick in and increase. When you get better at the game, this is when you are told to purchase additional weapons and perks in League of Legends in order to win ranked battles. This is something that often happens naturally and unconsciously. In Valorant, for example, you play one game with the six characters that come free. Then you see other people playing with locked characters that have cooler abilities, better skill sets. You also want to access that because often when individuals are gaming, they're hyper competitive. You then either have to spend thousands of hours on the game in order to unlock all of these characters or you have to pay for them. One of those options is often physically impossible for many individuals. They end up just paying in most cases. But in addition, when you have already invested more time into the gameplay, they, these companies start charging you to level up by making you purchase a PowerPoints and Brawl Stars and Clash Royale. It's really frustrating for you to get to level 99, but not be able to access level 100 because you need to pay. It means people often end up paying because they don't want their hours wasted. Companies also implement these payments in very subtle ways that make individuals not be able to realize it. So no single purchase may be worth a lot of money, i.e. it doesn't cost you hundreds of dollars to buy a skin, but that cost adds up and increases when you're consistently putting in money to make these upgrades in the long run. Most importantly, this accumulates over time. The more you've committed, the greater your sunk cost. You have spent so much money, you do not want to waste it. This means players don't end up opting out. They simply choose to make these purchases in the future. Additionally, there's often obsessive cultures. This is when your favorite streamers bought by gun skins, when all your friends seemed cooler than you. This is a networking effect, when you do not want to be left out of the fun and you buy, even if it's not really useful for you. Why has this been really harmful? It's harmful on two levels. Firstly, principally, this is a predatory and exploitative profit model. This is no different from how loan sharks currently operate, when they entice you with supposedly low interest when they prey on your vulnerability to get money quickly, when they tell you that the future cost is not something you should have to massively worry about when your current cost or your current satisfaction right now is important. It is then morally legitimate for governments to intervene and protect consumers from predatory corporations and gaming models. Note that governments already do this with lots of anti antitrust regulations. But practically, many individuals end up spending lots of money subconsciously throughout time, often totaling more than what they would otherwise pay for with a one-time paid game that usually costs about 20 US dollars. But also, we agree. 
people are probably not going to go bankrupt, but you still lose significant, some significant amounts of money that you could have otherwise used better to better your quality of life, to save up for the future. And that is still really bad. Why does this massively reduce on our side on the comparative? Because often individuals don't get this miscalculation. Either the game is a one-time payment. And when you make this decision, you're not as addicted yet. You haven't experienced the game yet. You are less likely to be this irrational. But we do agree that you, that you may spend time on our side. We see spending time alone to play these games is still better than spending both time and money on their savvy house. Overall, even though one-time payments may be higher at first, you are likely to spend less on net than on the many upgrades you get in free-to-play games. Second argument, how do we get more entertaining gameplay? Before that, I'll take a point. Yeah, buying a $20 skin, cosmetic skin, doesn't cause massive harm. Predatory marketing is literally just advertising. Would you also ban makeup for preying on people's insecurities? No, no, no. Our claim is that cost increases over time. And even though the cost is few, it's not very high at the start, that gradually increases and something you can control. Secondly, how do we get more entertaining gameplay? The first question under this is what are the incentives of free-to-play gaming companies? Because this is their one stream of revenue on their side. Companies have strong incentives to make as many people as possible spend and make in-game purchases de facto necessary. Why does this decrease competition in games? Because this incentive means corporations code the game so it's difficult to win against another player with better skins, for instance. Regardless of the effort or time players put in. The game is designed so you are enticed to buying the add-ons. Obviously, it's not that players who pay automatically win because it's boring, but it's that they have a far higher chance or you perceive them to have a higher chance. So with Genshin Impact, it looks like the game making it practically impossible to hit a final boss level. So the people end up spending lots of money on better characters like Ayaka to get there. It means that in Brawl Stars, people can die very quickly if they don't have rare chromatic high power characters. Why is this so harmful? It means you actually reduce the satisfaction of the game. It's frustrating when you spend hours on a game when it means it's frustrating when the hours you spend on a game means nothing when there's a player who paid who means they have a disproportionate advantage and you do not get fair gameplay games are meant to be enjoyable in a competition of skill that gives you a shot of dopamine rather than competition of who can pay the most what is the comparative we say players are more likely to compete on fair grounds on our side you do not need to pay in order to win but rather you can practice and make these and it makes these games a lot more fun but on our side players probably still have to commit some time but it is far less likely companies make people play for hours or thousands of hours to get a rank upgrade because very few will commit in that case. They likely, they will decrease the game time needed for you to get a certain upgrade. So we don't think a time commitment is symmetric. Lastly then, on reducing addiction. The premise is addiction is really dangerous. It deprives people of their autonomy and traps them. We say that free to play games give companies a much stronger incentive to get people addicted in the first place. When you want people to play the game more and more, buy more things, and this is your profit model, by the way, in order to incentivize users to buy their upgrades, game companies have to make you extremely addicted to it. You have to be willing to go a step further, to give up your real life harder money in these game upgrades. On our side, if there's an upfront cost you set up, or if you use advertising revenue, there's less of an incentive to get people addicted to playing your game 24 seven. Instead, it's about getting new people to join your game. And we say those incentives are very different. Why do companies not maximize addictive potential in regular games on our side? Because if the game has an upfront cost, there's no marginal revenue to be gained by keeping a user glued to the screen 24 seven. You already have obtained some level of the revenue. But if a game has no upfront cost, we say companies do admittedly earn money through ads and thus keep users on for longer. But there is some cost to making your game more addictive. This is paying coders, con conducting trials with gamers to see if addiction is working. These costs aren't worth it if all you stand to gain is some marginal ad revenue. However, in-game transactions are more valuable. They exceed the cost of making a game more addicting. That's why it is asymmetric on both sides of the house. We are just at the ensure that gaming companies are unable to prey on individuals, uh, to prey on individuals' vulnerabilities. We are the side that makes sure companies are unable to adopt predatory profit-gaining models. I thank the speaker for the fine speech. And now I call on the first opposition speaker to open the bench side here, here. Hi, can I be heard? Yes. All right, give me a minute. I'll take verbal POIs, please, starting my speech in three, two, one. The ability to access escapism should never be locked behind a paywall. 
proposition leaves the emotionally distressed participants of society two options, struggle with their stresses unaided or pay for the right to solace. The stance on opposition is threefold. Number one, we support the status quo without banning free to play games, and we support the range of games for consumers to enjoy. Secondly, free to play games as per the info slide and unlike first proposition's assertions, give access to a sizable portion of the game, meaning that the advantages are not necessary to obtaining the experience of the game, it nearly enhances it. For example, if you get skins, it's merely a customizing the looks of your characters, or you have certain leg ups, but you can still complete the quest without paying all of these. Lastly, we think that financial transactions can have information so that people know that they're not being scammed. Insofar as propositions like harm in this debate, it's about harmful financial like decisions and not actually problems with video games. We think we can have regulations to make sure people don't ridiculously spend on things they don't know what they're getting into. We think proposition therefore cannot just give us a laundry list of harms. Just because something is bad doesn't mean you have to ban it. Given that everybody doesn't extract the same harm that proposition claims, we're going to prove to you why in most instances that harm doesn't exist and why therefore you shouldn't meet the standard to ban this. But before I do that, three responses to the speaker before me. Firstly, on their mechanism and this also responses to their third argument. They tell you that they have the incentive to make games as addictive as possible, but what they're really telling you is a euphemism for as enjoyable as possible. Because the only thing that games can really do to you is make you highly invested in the game, making an incredibly like entertaining user experience. This also responds to their last argument, but we would like to note as well that if addiction was so harmful and so crucial to this debate, the same incentives apply because you need the people to pay $20 enter the game to be so addicted to the game that they ask their friends to play it as well, that they recommend it to their communities and that they keep playing or still buying games from that same company insofar as that companies are still profit incentivized, the addiction claim stands on both sides of the house. But secondly, on exploitation then, I think it's only exploitation insofar as one side loses out in the transaction. Insofar as you pay and you get satisfaction from it, it's unclear as to why that is clearly and inherently a harmful form of so-called exploitation. What proposition really needs to tell us is why the decisions to access happiness, a sense of accomplishment, a sense of community through these games is inherently invalid and they cannot access this because we think you're paying for the happiness, for example, what? of cooler on screen. This is something some people do genuinely want and find happiness in. Proposition cannot invalidate that just because they don't think it is valuable. But all of their harms then are not unique, right? Because not unique to video games or to free to play games. Because if you were engrossed in fashions, you would buy the latest products. Unlike their response to the POI, the cost does increase over time. You start with drugstore lip balm, you move on to more expensive high-end products. It is symmetrical. Proposition cannot say that they want to ban everything that has some kind of addiction or some kind of like ability to get you invested in the subject. But secondly, they tell you about how they incentivize you to buy things in subtle ways by pricing things cheaply. This doesn't lead to exploitation. This is just marketing and selling their products. It's unclear as to why that is inherently exploitative and immoral. But lastly, then the only moral hazard therefore they give us is what? loan sharks. But the difference here is that loan sharks promise you money you don't get. Games provide you with happiness and a sense of accomplishment that you do achieve at the end of the day. They promise you excitement. You get excitement. That is the only reason why you continue playing and the only reason why you will continue in the game in a free-to-play model, given you could just leave the game since there is no sunk cost in that game whatsoever. We think, in fact, we increase the ability for users to like uh, be, be responsible in their purchases. Given that there is no sunk cost fallacy, they would opt out if they didn't want to engage in the game. But lastly, let's talk about fair gameplay, right? I think let's just note up first, it is ridiculous for proposition to assert that government somehow gets to decide what Genshin does and whether or not Genshin is a fair gameplay. Why is that anywhere in the realm of the responsibility of banning? But I think it also mischaracterizes what it means to engage in free-to-play gameplay. We told you that the games would already be meaningfully accessible and it will not be necessarily so. It's so difficult and frustrating because then nobody would engage in the game. But also, noting that our worst case where it, they, they do make it impossible for you to reach the final boss level, note the crucial nuance. This is the final, final level. Out of the millions of majorities of players, most people never even get that far, which means that the accessibility and happiness we afford to consumers are on a far broader scale when proposition only deals with the last minority of individuals. Yeah. And we don't think they're as important when you weigh it out with the solace others can get. But crucially as well, if they wanted to talk about gameplay, I think proposition cannot talk about like exploitation, right? They either have to choose. They want good gameplay or they want good consumers. Insofar as proposition conflicts good gameplay and exploitation, they cannot have both. Before I go on to my argument, I'll take a point. Just to confirm, you believe individuals spending thousands of hours a year in gaming is good because people gain enjoyment from it. 
Yeah, just because you don't enjoy it doesn't mean other people don't, right? Other people might not find happiness in debating. Some people think that you don't find happiness from speaking to a camera, but that is what you decide. And we think they should allow them to make these decisions. Two arguments then to forward from opposition. Firstly, on why it's crucial to protect the autonomy of individuals in three ways. Number one, let's talk about the importance of free to play games to consumers. We think this looks like two crucial structural reasons. We think firstly, this is the perfect balance between accessibility and enjoyable. Because on proposition, these premium games require you to pay upfront and most individuals individuals don't have the capacity to spend, for example, $20 of their lunch money on seeking solace every month. But secondly, we think this crucially because it's so accessible, it creates the largest community base. And for example, it becomes more competitive. So you have more people to interact with. People use these as vices, as stress relief, as escapism. It is uniquely that interactive competition that provides individuals with the adrenaline rush and that exciting engagement of all senses that assaults the individuals that allows them to experience this in the best possible way. We think banning this takes away, doesn't necessarily take away the necessity for an intense vice. So proposition would have these individuals default to other methods, for example, in two ways. Number one, to defaulting to the game which require you to pay, which is objectively a bad thing because since proposition says they don't want consumers to spend money, on a proposition we are telling you they are going to be spending money because they need to have that vice. But secondly, it leads to more perniciously, more destructive forms of vices, i.e. vandalism, alcoholism, or substance abuse because they need something to escape the realities that only we provide. We think in most instances, people want to release stress from free to play games, but we think we uniquely empower their individuality because you can pick and choose between games without the opportunity cost. If you use paid games on proposition side of the house, you have to look through reviews, synopsis. This is all a time spent that you're not able to spend relieving your, your like unhappiness. We think proposition loses out on utility there. We we will then be able, we, we say that we're able to pivot, that all our alternatives will guarantee your self-relaxation because you can choose. But secondly, how does prop proposition in institute a blanket ban when they cannot impact and harm like the diff when the impacts and harm differ from person to person i think other destructive harms we ban in society they are guaranteed like harms in every single instance i.e hard drugs in most instances but free to play games are structurally different since free to play games also don't rely on most people paying their games it means most people never end up spending money anyway the opportunity cost of a majority of the population losing out on this benefit is something we will not stand for but lastly the exclusive benefits because most of the opt-in on our side of the house only happens when, for example, like Dota has 8 million players globally, you have chat in game, you bond over communities, this increased community interaction is a crucial form of solace only we get to claim. But the second argument about how we engineer structures to facilitate growth and improvement within the industry, three things. Number one, the development of a game requires balancing between investing into the game and profiteering. Proposition leaves companies with two options. Number one, no profit at all, which means it's easily exhausted and you have no incentive to improve the gameplay. But secondly, you only need to have game at the start, which means you don't in fact improve it over time. Ours uniquely built on the sustainability of the interests of the consumer base, which also deals with Proposition's third argument. Because the role of games is to get you engrossed, is to get you to forget reality, and that is what we have under our side of the house. You're able to extend to people who don't play as well, because when you improve the game, even people who play for free are able to benefit from all of these advances. On our side of the house, we protect the right for individuals to choose. We, provide the, we protect the right for individuals to have solace, proud to oppose. I thank the speaker for the fine speech. And to continue for Team Prop, I call on the second speaker uh, here, here. All right. Um, so, assuming that everybody can hear me, I'd prefer my POIs audibly. Uh, so, feel free to unmute during our reflect time. Team Malaysia is the team that believes that addiction in video gaming simply doesn't exist. An industry which forces you to spend thousands of hours on gaming that has literal rehab centers for people who have become too addicted, they say, oh no, addiction is actually just a euphemism for enjoying the game. Guys, yes, being addicted to cocaine might mean I enjoy cocaine, but I'm still addicted to cocaine. The issue here is that enjoying gaming isn't as innocuous as it seems. Because yes, it's escapism, but when it addicts you, traps you out of reality for that long, takes away from other aspects of your life, we say this is an active harm. They can't wave away the worst of their damages. Several clashes in the speech and then two splits. Before that though, quick note, O1 says based on the motion that paid upgrades are going to be really marginal, unimportant, or cosmetic. Let me read out the motion to Malaysia because they can't seem to do so by themselves. Video games are games that give players access to a size 
sizable portion or to the start of their gaming content without paying. What that means is, yes, some of these games might give you a lot of content for free, or they might just give you the start of your game for free. I suggest they actually read the info slide. Here's the structural reason that companies won't give you that much content for free, though. Companies obviously want money, right? I.e., they want to give you as little content as possible up front and try to trap everything they can possibly behind a paywall. Yes, they give you a bit to start off, but then they want you to pay to access more. Just like a drug dealer would, they give you a bit to begin with, then make you pay for the rest. That's the entire point. But if we point to reality, which we literally gave you a host of examples at first, the source of payments you make are really important for gameplay. In FIFA, even to literally play a full kickoff match, you need to pay. Or even if not, we told you it's a perception issue. You fear you're losing out. People are really competitive. It's a networking effect. All of these issues still exist. Owen also says regulations exist so people don't make misinformed decisions. How are they possibly going to implement regulations, right? Look at the only country that has actually implemented regulations on this, China. Unless they suggest a totalitarian, gov totalitarian government that watches everything you do in every single game in every single country, they really can't implement restrictions. It's not realistic. No, practically nowhere in the world does this. First class, who increases addiction? Because they told us that addiction isn't real. It's just enjoying the oh, game. Yeah. I already told you how ridiculous this is. There are literal rehabilitation centers that you have to go to if you get too addicted to something. The point is, and that because gaming companies now have a greater incentive to try to make you uh, get your face glued to the screen, try to get you to pay as much money, because now you're being addicted to the game directly translates to you buying more stuff, which directly translates to more money for the company. That means they have an active incentive to indeed run more trials to make sure that your games are as addictive as possible to get people to pay more. They also say, oh, but instead of gaming, if you lock people behind a paywall for the entire game, oh, people are now instead going to turn to drugs, alcohol, and other vices. Okay. Think of the average video gamer. Do you really think if they're like, oh no, I can't play Genshin, I now have to start snorting coke. Like this isn't practical. There's a very different bar of entry to alcoholism versus a video game. Sure, if you want a different sort of escapism, go watch Netflix, go watch TV. I don't think that their harms are remotely realistic. It's also a lot more accessible to download a game than to find a dealer or buy lots of alcohol. This shows how ridiculous Malaysia's case is. But let's talk about enjoyment because Malaysia completely misunderstands Maddie's argument when they say that people can right. access a significant portion of the game and access enjoyment anyway. You may believe that objectively, a game has some opportunities for people, but the perception is comparative. When you play Among Us, for example, you win one game. That's it. That's the full satisfaction because there's nothing else to win or pay for. But when you play Genshin Impact, a free to play game, maybe you succeeded at a single mission, but you know you could do more with a payment and you don't feel like you've totally won. You don't get the satisfaction of solace they talk about because the game is constantly telling you, hey, level up to access a new thing, you know, a new part of gameplay, a new cool cosmetic skin, a new ability that helps you become better at the game. This is because you compare your successes to the successes of those around you. It's obviously not just about skins, it's about accessing new levels better upgrades to win the game. We gave you examples and so does the info slide. So free to play games actually do not give you enjoyment because you are constantly frustrated by not being able to actually win the game because there's always another thing to do, another thing to pay for, another level to play. Here's an analogy. Maybe Malaysia will be happy if they win this round, but if they don't break, I'll be damned if they think this tournament gave them any solace, right? The idea is that if you constantly trap everything behind a greater wall, then you're not going to get the enjoyment you need. Second so question, exploitation. Because we told you very clearly that, that because of the addictive tendencies and because of the mis advertising of such things, that this is an exploitative program. What do they say? This isn't like loan sharks. Loan sharks promise you money that you uh, and, and uh, that you will not get. Judge, here's what a loan shark does. Tell me if this sounds familiar, by the way. Someone tells you that they can give you money to save your dying mother to pay your rent, but then they start to exponentially increase interest rates. They give you the money up front, or maybe the enjoyment from the game up front, that's the most attractive part of loan sharks. But the point is that you only realize what the costs are afterwards. Even if you know those costs theoretically exist, they only become real, materialized in your mind, allow you to make a fully consenting informed decision later on. That's why people make miscalculations, bad decisions. I may realize that a loan shark's interest rates are predatory, but I don't actually realize that and make a decision based on that until it's way too late. The exact same thing happens with video gaming. They just tell us, oh, it's a marketing, like makeup ads. Okay, makeup ads may be predatory, but the harm often isn't massive. You buy a cosmetic product, but the harm of predatory marketing is massive and is extreme but in quite different cases uh, quite frequent cases catastrophic pouring most of your income into a game uh, for special power users given that we can't ban everything due to limited political capital we simply want to ban the things that are very harmful yes obviously there's a spectrum of coercion here we think when you literally have a situation that looks like you're going to rehab for gaming i think yeah it's generally true that it is exploitation and who on earth by the way is buying 500 chanel dresses after buying one for these kinds of products they provide the full benefit with one product unlike these games that keep pressuring you to buy more. Then they see, oh, people don't, most people don't even get to the super high levels that they need to pay for. This is a one example 
we gave, right? Look at everything else we tell you. For a lot of games, the most fundamental aspects of gameplay, indeed like kickoff, playing a full match of football in FIFA, is only accessible behind the paywall. Thirdly, on better gameplay, because we told you how the fact that uh, you are constantly trapped and feel inferior to other people who have the upgrades that you want, when you can't even access the full parts of the game, you feel bad. What do they say? Companies have no incentive to improve the game on our side. Companies still need to have a large number of people continuously play because that's how you earn ad revenue or earn more upfront payments, right? However, companies can't retain players if the game doesn't get better because people get bored. There are thousands of other games you could be playing. It's very hard to capture the time of people. Companies will still improve the game. This isn't symmetric though because the profit incentives are different. Ad revenue is one thing, but actually actively buying uh, uh, upgrades is another thing. There's a greater profit incentive. Note that the incentive of companies is to make improvements on op, but it's to suck, it isn't improvement on op, but it's to suck out as much money as they can. Meaning the improvements are likely to be bad more expensive, powerful skins, more coercion. Finally, I want to note just generally, Wait. the entire point of this is that you are likely to spend more by playing a free to play game rather than one that has an upfront cost. Look at why companies are currently moving into free to play games, right? It's not because they're benevolent, it's because they want more money and this is how they profit maximize. Before my splits, I'll take that point. What exactly is your metric to ban? It is not predatory pricing or predatory ads because you concede makeup is the same. It's also not addiction because you okay, defend- okay, I, I get the point is that there's a spectrum, right? But it's a combination of the harm that's happening and the addiction that's happening. We prove significant harm when you spend so much money and time and a significant level of addiction when there's little rehab centers, et cetera, existing with gaming. Okay, uh, first split, what games become less expensive? First on mechanism, uh, on an incentive mechanism. We think people want inherently cheaper games. The issue is that game companies know that they're always gonna lose out to free to play games from the people who want them. On our side, the market of people who want free games is less saturated with free to play ones. And therefore game companies will lower prices because they have the possibility of getting these lower cost demanding gamers. This tackles a push on access. On capacity, I think as more people are now more willing to buy upfront game costs, that means you can lower your individual price because you're selling more units. This actually makes all games more accessible on our side, lowering price. Secondly, very quickly on my last bit on harming game developers. Quick context, game developers work in horrifying conditions right now, known as crunch, where they have to work 12 plus hours a day under really brutal working conditions. What does crunch increase on opposition? Because in order for companies to keep earning money, they have to keep churning out new upgrades, can, cosmetics, gameplay every single week for people to buy meaning that game developers are under constant pressure to force to be forced to work even longer hours because they need to produce new things code design new skins this really matters these workers are the workers behind the product we consume we have to consider the ethics of the supply chain like we do in anything else opposition maximizes crunching predatory labor opposition is a side that supports addiction exploitation practices both in the production and consumption of video games I thank the speaker for a fine speech. And to continue, I call on the second opposition speaker, Hehe. Yeah, can I check that I'm audible? Uh, you are indeed, yeah. Okay, thanks, great. Um, I'll take POIs verbally, so just unmute yourself. Starting in three, two, one. Did they try to equate Dota to loan sharks? Because I think proposition has a fundamental misunderstanding of the things that they need to do in this round. Their burden isn't to give you a harm. Their burden is to tell you why it necessitates a ban. They gave you two metrics. We proved to you why it failed in first opposition. What is second prop's POI response? That there's a combination of harm. That isn't a metric to ban. There's a combination of harm to a multitude of things. I can do ballet and break my leg, but that does not mean we should ban ballet. You can do a multitude of things that constitute a harm. You need to give us the definable metrics as to what it is. We outlined from first opposition that there's likely two things, given those are the two arguments given to you in the first proposition speech. They talked to you, number one, about predatory marketing and number two about addiction to deal with addiction second proper proposition literally keeps contradicting themselves every single time they talk about why games are bad also defend paid games defend completely free games with no in-game purchases at all and also defend game developing in and of itself their own third argument told you why they also had games when they argued a whole argument about bad working conditions and the quote-unquote crunch crunch time or whatever that is because I don't actually know what gaming the gaming developing scene actually looks like that that means that they can't argue a generic case about addiction because that would mean they have to argue against banning all video games but they clearly in their first proposition were unwilling to actually constitute and take that burden therefore the only other metric left standing in order to justify their ban is predatory marketing they say that they trap you make you addicted make you insecure because your friends look cooler than you in game and therefore it's predatory and it's exploitation and we should ban. 
two things here. Number one, note that their problem, therefore, is not with free-to-play games and the in-game purchases that currently exist. Their problem is the way in which these purchases are marketed and advertised. Per second proposition's own speech, the way in which ads pre ads predate on your own experiences and make you buy certain things means that it's not the innate ability for you or the profit system that is pro that's problematic, but necessarily the way in which ads are, do are, ads are currently being done and unregulated. So therefore, they have a problem solution mismatch that they could easily solve absent of the ban that they want to constitute. But not also, because they never actually argued exploitation and predation at all. They analyzed developing a game so good people are hooked. Where was the coercion? Where do we predate on your insecurities? The insecurity that it quoted and highlighted is just the innate human uh, experience of wanting to have levels of fun and levels of enjoyment. That never meant that you exploited individuals. That never meant that you predated on these individuals that were vulnerable and in these kinds of states. Insofar as these aren't things that forced you and these are other alternatives that you can have opted in to a multitude of other things that you still chose to do a game. But second, we drew you parallels in status quo that are even worse but are permitted. Note that the importance of this isn't just a frivolous example, but it proves that the metric in society that it currently exists right now does not meet the bar that they set for themselves. We told you makeup. What about diet culture and the way in which diet culture is perpetuated when people have to constantly eat salads? What about mental health when you predict on the insecurity of individuals who come into therapy for people that have mental conditions? What was the response we heard from second proposition, which is literally baffling? They said makeup is not that bad compared to spending thousands of dollars in game. Makeup is not that bad, but makeup causes body dysmorphia. Makeup makes people look in the mirror and want to kill themselves or be prone to not being able to live the next day. These are individuals that constantly feel inferior to themselves in society. And that is the thing that they said was not actually enough to actually constitute a pan that makeup is not enough. Therefore, if that is the case and the examples hold true, the metric to the ban therefore does not stand. Therefore, even in its best form from proposition, if they are harmed, you cannot credit any of them because they still need to justify it under the lens of actually banning them in the first place. But second, note that um, the important thing here that we characterize in this speech is that there is an incentive that exists to not only, number one, cater towards a massive consumer base in order to get access, but also, number two, to also try to profit off individuals through their longevity within the market. We told you on our side that they have to balance both incentives, which is why it's not the case that second proposition wants to highlight where you're going to completely lock them out altogether and they're not able to enjoy the experience at all. Because if that is the case, there are a, there are a multitude of other free-to-play games that fill in the gap that give people the actual consumer experiences and it is the case where these purchases are purely cosmetic or add marginal utility towards these games. They say they use examples, then use all of them in the info slide. In Dota and League of Legends, if you're unable to purchase a skin, you're, all you have to do is play until level 20 to access most of the game modes, most of the things. It is about 20 hours of having to invest in that, which we think is reasonable. What is the ability for you to lose any sort of gratification in the first place? But secondly, note the assertion that you feel bad because other people people do better than you. Note that this also is not actually constituting a ban, but note that you think it's highly assertive for them to say so. Because for some people, it might be true that if other people are able to buy their way in game and overcome certain challenges, that you may feel jealous or you may feel bad. But for a group of individuals as well, sometimes the process is one that means a lot to them. It looks like you having to grind every single day and actually earning the achievements in the game rather than purchasing it. So contrary to what they say, sometimes it's actually gratifying, which is why on our side, we said multiple games can exist to cater to multiple people. Some games are hard to access. Some games are easier to access. People are able to decide for themselves. For a proposition to make a blanket ban when some people actually feel good to, because some people feel bad does not actually justify it at all. And lastly then, on the idea that they also have access and we can make cheap games. This is the concession as to why they can't co-op our gaming experience. We already preempted this from first opposition, that yes, it is true that gaming companies and gaming developers may make cheaper games, but note that there is still a cost. That if they make cheaper games, the problem with the revenue model is that it's inherently going to have to be a worse game because you don't have sustainability. On our side, it's the only model where you constantly gain revenue to channel back into the money. Because once there's a one-off payment, there is no incentive to make the game better because you've already trapped these individuals 
inside. Note, therefore, the arguments standing left on opposition are unresponded to from second prop and requires a response from third prop. But I think at this point, it is far too late. We told you why, therefore, the autonomy of individuals ought to be prioritized. That if individuals feel levels of gratification, who is the state to intervene and deprive them of these kinds of experiences? We told you, therefore, also, that they will pivot to other worse vices. Proposition just saying alcoholism isn't actually the alternative, is not actually a response. There's a scale, like they say, to the response that each individual has. If their stakeholder was the person that spent thousands of dollars in game, the individuals that spent millions of hours or thousands of hours not going to work, etc., these are likely the people that would have pivoted to those worst forms of alternatives because they weren't recreational gamers. These are individuals that divulge and has needed really strong forms of escapism to so deal with the harm on your side. Third substantive then, on how, um, third substantive then on how you create a system where a small SMEs are unable to pre penetrate the market and you create stagnancy within the gaming market. Note that you shut out entertainment SMEs from effectively competing in the market because when there's a paywall introduced, who do consumers pivot to? It is likely going to be therefore based on consumer trust and buy-in. That if two companies make the exact same, make a game, but both of them cost $20, I'm more likely to buy from an established one like Valve or Riot Games or Blizzard as opposed to a new up-and-coming developer. These large established game developing companies are likely going to pivot into their own niches and subdivide the community. This company will focus on action games. This company will focus on indie games and this company will focus on RPG, which means that there's necessarily less competition contrary to what they say. So they can't co-op the benefits of competition. The reason why this is important is that it kills off innovation and diversity in the gaming industry. Not only number one on the base level for entertainment, but number two, the development of important technologies like augmented reality technology first gain traction by making it a, by making augmented reality games that in the future right now can be implemented to a multitude of industries in society for two reasons you give it to op you give it because the individuals deserve autonomy and you give it to opposition because we actually care about the consumer experience i thank the speaker for the fine speech and now i call on the third proposition speaker here here Um, sorry, the laptop I was meant to speak at disconnected from the Zoom. Um, Drew is currently going to connect it back. Okay. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. Um, let's let's let, yeah let's do it ASAP. But but sure yeah. Apologies for the technical issues. Sorry. Um, I use she/her pronouns. POIs in the chat, please. I'll open the chat right now so I can see the POIs. This debate is about video games. Malaysia wants to make a case for makeup. Our burden is not to show that everything harmful would be banned. It was to show that we made the world better when free to play games were. At best, we're not principally perfect to remove all forces of coercion in the world, but we reduce a massive one at least. Our case obviously doesn't praise the cosmetic industry. However, it's realistically impossible to ban everything. So we are banning FTP canes. Instead of nitpicking our case, Malaysia needs to engage. Two questions then. Firstly, which side provides, prevents exploitation and addiction? And secondly, which side provides better gameplay? Firstly, I want to deal with their claim and clarification. They claim that this heart doesn't necessitate a ban, but here's why governments ban things. Firstly, because the risk is too high. We agree that most things have both risks and rewards. We agree that soft drugs can give many people momentary highs and enjoyment and can still bring many people happiness, but governments still intervene to ban it because the risk of getting more people addicted, the risk of them getting addicted and turning to harder drugs is far more harmful. Would rather individuals not be able to access this 
increased happiness they receive from drugs, but be shielded from massive potential harms. Similarly, even if opposition manages to prove free-to-play games bring people happiness, which we show isn't even true, we think the current landscape of addiction, of unnecessary and irrational spending by young people, is still a risk we want to prevent. But secondly, don't let opposition make the harm of free-to-play games seem insignificant. The harm is that teenagers are taking credit card numbers of their parents to pay for skins, and some are even taking up debt. Sure, this might be the extreme cases, but the harms are so immense for the minority of individuals who are impacted by it. Note that such extreme harm, even to a small number of people, does necessitate abandoning the status quo. The majority of people won't be addicted to drugs to the extent that it is lethal, but we still ban it. But thirdly, note that opposition's response to this principle is literally a couple of examples tossed around. They never give you reasoning why. So maybe you believe that regulation is better. You may still be able to regulate ads or makeup companies, but we told you how regulation is impossible with games because you would literally have to monitor the online actions of every single player. This is a massive invasion of privacy. The trade-off then is a ban or nothing at all, which is why a ban is justified. A quick clarification, they say that our harms don't occur because you give companies access to a sizable and players access to a sizable portion of the game. We do agree, but if companies make 90% of their game accessible, no one is going to pay for these perks and upgrades. This means that the company probably makes 30% of their gaming free to first entice users so they can profit off of the other 70% of locked upgrades. Note, this is the premise of all their impacts. They give you no structural reasons. Drew told you that this was comparative happiness. Firstly, then, on which I prevent exploitation. Firstly, we told you that it was morally abhorrent to that free-to-play games were predatory. Because with free-to-play games, when players first download the game, they're deceived into believing that the game is free, that there's limited cost because most people falsely believe that they're not going to be easily addicted to an app. But when you keep playing the game, that is when you're told to purchase additional gadgets to win battles you have already spent so much time trying to defeat to no avail. This is predatory because these games are created to be addictive to begin with. On principle, it's the same way gamblers entice innocent victims into losing more and more amounts of money when casinos exploit you. But practically, you do lose a decent portion of your money that you would otherwise spend to take your nephew out to treat your wife. The comparative is that when you make the decision to pay upfront, you're not yet addicted and this coercive mechanism doesn't exist. But for free games, you're not exploited to give up vast amounts of money. Their response was firstly, that you get satisfaction, so this isn't exploitation. Addiction is a euphemism of enjoyability. Firstly, we told you that many harmful acts are enjoyable, such as consuming drugs or gambling, but the government still bans it. Obviously, video games aren't this extreme, but if Malaysia claims that their effect is so pervasive that video games can literally help you forget about problems so extreme you otherwise need alcohol to wash them away, then video games clearly have a strong sway over the average person their own analysis. The harm of this way was that you continually bleed money into this game, that you now rarely spend time with your family. Obviously, you don't lose all your life savings, but you do lose a decent portion. Secondly, we don't think we actually lose out on enjoyability because the game development market is massively competitive. Look at the number of free games on Google Play and the Apple Store right now. So if your game isn't enjoyable, then people won't play. This means that developers, even without these free-to-play games, want to create the best game so they generate advertising revenue. They do not want to lose out. The second speaker then claims that game developers will split the market so you don't actually get this competition. So for example, certain ones focus on makeup games, other ones focus on action games. But we think that this is really false because if you as a company like Supercell can make multiple games and if you can make more money from those multiple games, when you already have hired coders, when you already have the infrastructure and code in place, you probably want to make multiple apps catering to multiple different audiences to maximize your own profit. Thus, we do actually get the competition which increases innovation and enjoyability. But our second claim under this clash was that we actually reduce a and this was not a contradiction, by the way. We can see that we still have games under our side, but that these games were far less addicting. Because with free-to-play games, companies are far more likely to invest in high-cost departments that research into psychology and addiction when you can continually bleed users of their money. Our comparative was that with a one-time pay model, you don't need to keep players glued to the screen because you have already gained profit. With free games, the revenue you gain from ads is not worth the money you need to invest into paying many coders into conducting trials to increase addiction. Secondly, then, on which side provides better gameplay before that you why? Yeah, most individuals are casual spenders, not the people that plunge themselves into debt. Are you actually hinging your case on the few individuals that actually spend thousands of dollars? Our case was never that extreme, but it was the fact that for these casual spenders, it was often a subconscious accumulation of money, when maybe each small purchase is not a lot of money, but they add up over time. We gave you this analysis from first. But secondly, on better game pay. On the quality, we told you that games were more entertaining, because with free-to-play games, for companies to make players pay for their perks, they need to make these perks central to the game. This looks like rare chromatic brawlers and brawl stars that give you a disproportionate advantage in bottles. By the way, it wasn't just a minority of players who could not get into the final level that were harmed when most sections are locked up, because this is what maximizes profit 
market for game developers. This means that for the 40% of other people that don't pay, these games are frustrating when you seem to always lose because players that pay have a far better gear and they can snipe you far easily, far, far more easier. Our response, their response here was that if it's too frustrating, people don't play. Obviously, you're not going to instantly lose just because you don't pay, but it's the fact that there might be some semblance of battle, but you ultimately consistently lose, this is still frustrating. On the comparative, it now becomes a competition of skill rather than money. It means that people don't get to actually get the solace we talk about. Instead, under their side, they're constantly frustrated. Their response to us was that development needs profiteering, so you get no profit at all, which means we don't get any development. Firstly, we already explained why gaming is still a competitive market, because if you get terrible reviews, if there's constantly bugs in your software, you get zero players and zero advertising money. And note, the comparative in this debate isn't to play Valorant or take drugs. It is, do you play a free-to-play game or play a different game? Or a, like, for example, a one-time pay game under our side. But the wing here is that in order for Malaysia's principle on the metric for a ban to stand, they have to prove that there's such a massive benefit to these games that people lose out on. But we prove why we actually make the gaming experience better, why we increase enjoyability, so there is no loss of benefits to ban these games. But the second part of this was accessibility. We also told you that games were now far more accessible because Trio's first split was on incentive and capacity. Because now that you get upfront paid games, you have a greater chance to cater to people who want low priced games, and they will want to lower these costs to appeal to them. They, these companies also now have a greater capacity to lower unit costs because more people will buy it. In the comparative, you literally see many more companies going towards the free to play game model, which means you don't actually get accessibility. You might get 20% accessibility at first, but for the rest of the game, costs are often high when companies want to get you addicted when they want you to lose your money so they can gain more. Their response was on escapism and how it shouldn't be locked behind a paywall and that they get the perfect balance between accessibility and, enjoy and enjoyability. Firstly, we also get enjoyability. Free games exist on both sides of the house. Our claim was that we actually get more enjoyability because you specifically switch the incentives of developers to make it more accessible now that there's a bigger market for it. But secondly, we told you why companies are likely to reduce costs and juice split. But thirdly, they claim that sustenance abuse would occur otherwise. But note how absurd this is, because individuals aren't searching for addiction. Just because you can no longer be addicted to free-to-play games, it doesn't mean that a person then tries to find something else to get addicted to it when it's in fact very harmful. But also, we think that if their solution to massive problems people face in daily lives is to spend a couple hours on your video games, this was really implausible. We think that we actually improve accessibility and we also improve enjoyability. Lastly, we also told you why game developers were likely harmed because of crunch time. I know that game developers cannot escape to another game company because this is the kind of culture that becomes the norm for most post game companies when you have uh, when you want to selectively lock out your workforce. Gaming companies should not prey on your vulnerabilities. Proud to stand. I thank the speaker for the fine speech and now I call on the op three speaker to continue here here. I, I, uh, am I audible and visible? You are indeed. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you are. I'll take POIs in the chat. Starting in three. Starting in three, two, one. Free-to-play gaming was an irreplaceable part of human recreational activity. The downfall of this proposition's case was their infatuation with the extremes. If they wanted to win this debate on the 1% of rehabilitated gamers, that already speaks for itself how ludicrous this case is, and it's clear that Team Hong Kong will lose this debate. The first thing I want to do is clarify their pigeonhole homogenized characterizations of gamers, because it's still unclear from all three speakers why everyone's goal was to beat the final boss. Not everyone needs to be the god tier gamer. Realistically, the average free to play player does not spend thousands of hours on a game to neglect their health and wallets. But what was the nuance here? The unique nuance we proved was that in free to play models in status quo was that the level of spending each player undertakes differs from gamer to gamer due to the diverse demographic of gamers when gaming becomes more common and accessible per their setup which meant the 10% of rich or professional gamers could spend more on the game while casual chill gamers could gain the most accessible experience without having to plunge their wallets into it. This is in stark contrast to their side, where if companies were exploitative, every single person across the board will need to pay the cost of buying the game from the app store, which is likely to be high per their own setup about how companies have the ability to increase these prices. What then is the crucial comparative here? 
Their setup from first prop that companies are revenue maximizing was fatal to their case because it proves an express preference for making lots of money anyway. However, the nuance is those game companies become substantially more predatory on their side. Structurally, this is because the mechanism for gaining money needs to be constant and sustainable because you aren't able to have players buy new guns every week or pay on a subscription battle pass every three months. But rather, they pay off a one-time one purchase of the app store and that's it. Which means if they want to make those things profitable, either they will have to make the initial cost of buying the game really high or they have other mechanisms inside the game to profit off. What do this look like? Because pay-to-pay -pay premium games on their side was stagnant, once someone buys the initial game, that's it. They can't support other internal purchases because that will contradict the entirety of the first prop speech, which means they resort to other mechanisms. Things like data selling, things like sexual imagery, things like carefully selected colors that reinforce serotonin in your brain, which means you're also more addicted to these games to gain more money then. So therefore, if companies were likely to be predatory, absent the mechanism of wanting to have these microtransactions, it gets far worse on their end without the unique value you get from being able to purchase something that levels you up. And note, if people were so addicted to these games per their analysis, you can't challenge those games as opposed to the argument we provided to you at the end of second op about why there's better competition. On our side, we have both free to play and pay to play games, which means they compete against each other actively. That is them out of the round, even on their best case comparative. Three issues then in this speech. First, on the principal justification, why it's a valuable activity. Second, on why this enhances the gaming experience. And third, on why game companies develop significantly worse behavior. First, is this justified? I think the fact that First Prop immediately starts off their case by equating this mobile games to illegal loan sharks is quite laughable. The underlying premise is that malevolent companies provide you no way to opt out of this. We told you if companies were inherently malevolent, they will find other ways to shackle their consumers, but we can actually regulate them to no response. Four structural reasons why we could. First, community discussions, things like supercell forums or criticism from YouTubers means they respond to feedback to prevent consumers from leaving. This is a self-correcting mechanism that engages in their context on revenue maximization. Just look at how much anger EA has gotten in the past few years. They concede to this at third prop when they say people become frustrated at bugs, which proves it's an effective mechanism. This doesn't happen on their side because consumers are more averse to leaving or criticizing the game once they've paid for the lump sum and all other alternatives are locked behind a paywall. Second, regulation. The App Store and Google Play forces you certain clauses. Our setup highlights this. Third, given it's a policy debate, we can probably use the fiat and capital to force this in. But fourth, competition from small developers means companies have to act in better ways or they'll be pushed out from the market. All the reasons they themselves give shows massive political will to prevent the worst accesses of these companies having anyways. Let's deal with your other principal claim then on you not being able to consent. Analyzing the problems of consent. First, is this informed? Clearly, you can tell that it was a free-to-play game. But second, if you whether it was retractable, the reason to why this is better on our side is yes. Even if you have social mechanisms like the fear of missing out, the reason why it's better on our side is because there are other alternatives for you to try with your friends. The comparison is that when most people have these things locked behind paywalls, then it's far, far harder for you to try those mechanisms in the first place, which means you're locked to these initial games. But even if you don't believe this to be true, note the abhorrence of the case reveals itself. Even if a few people end up becoming addicts, they have to prove why the small volume of pro gamers meant that all gamers across the board will now lose access to valuable games. The weighing here was simple. Given they themselves highlight mechanisms like rehab, it probably wasn't exclusive. But second, the extrapolation we proved here was crucial. They can't say this is a tool in a toolbox. This is one of many addictive things because their principle has to extend to all other policies the state imposes. We proved to you there was a massive moral hazard that the state gets to unilaterally decide that the source of recreation for millions of people ought to be banned forever. On volume, this harms massive amounts of people. Third prop says, drug users are in the minority, but we still ban drugs. There was a nuance. There are a small number of drug users, yes, but the portion of drug users that become addicted and die is huge. In comparison, the portion of gamers that become super addicted under their side is tiny, which is why it does not justify a Ban. So their rebuttal does not stand in the round. Before that, I'll take a point. Why will gaming companies literally illegally sell data instead of using advertising as revenue, similar to how news companies work? 
No, so if it's advertising, then it also has your claim on why people aren't able to have the best experience possible because you want to engineer things like data to show advertisements that are good for them. And that's how they'll stay on the game and get them addicted. So once again, people are locked in towards these games. They may not spend money, but your harm was never on spending money. It was locking people towards a game that had no alternatives. But second, we prove that most of the other mechanisms in society also require you to have spending. That's how most business models work. We prove some efficacy of regulation here. The reason as to why they will find other mechanisms is they can obviously do bad things if your site proves these companies are malevolent. The second issue was on gaming experiences. We, we give three categorical benefits here. First, that games were more entertaining because these games evolve over time when you have to update your content, which is in the interest of gamers. But second, the gaming community becomes larger, which is better for the demographic diversity, but also means you're better able to criticize these companies then. But third, we come actually prior here. Even if you buy the entirety of second prop on access uh, on here, even if the games are cheap, this was not the biggest consideration because people don't think that this game is $5. So I'll buy lots of $5 games. The difference here is that even if it's a $5 game, they still have to spend $5 on an unknown small company. The comparison is small companies will still be disadvantaged on, the, on our side, but you're better able to empower them at the point where none of your goods are hide, hid behind a paywall that people have to trust from the get-go, which meant that the underlying premise of all three features of their end is the inelasticity of games. We told you that games are significantly more diverse on our side because of competition but on the wide variety of content on games here. Their final claim is that game developers are under crunch. That this is their tension in their case because they claim that currently game developers are burnt out but also that most games are static in the status quo. This contradiction renders half of their speech useless to the round here but it means that most of their mechanisms are quite inexclusive because if companies were going to then burn out these people, they'll presumably do it on their end by finding other ways to profit of these people because there's far harder ways for you to make money once it's a one-off purchase that people have to continuously exploit which meant on our side we get better games at the point where companies no longer have to resort to bad things but actively compete against with each other then if they prove the viability of certain pay-to-pay -pay games could not exist in status quo they don't prove why it's going to be popular on their side if this debate were a clash royale match hong kong has already lost all three towers unfortunately they would have you do away with free-to-pay games the only thing they lost was all three ballots we are exceedingly proud to oppose I thank the speaker for the fine speech. And now I call on the op reply to conclude for op bench. Here, here. Yeah, can I check one more time that I'm audible? You are, yeah. Okay, great. Starting in three, two, one. Proposition clearly was on the receiving end of other people paying to win and them having to lose because they wanted to argue benefits in a vacuum and they only wanted to argue harms in a vacuum as well. If they wanted to constantly say that we cannot argue with extremes, they in their own speeches characterized that the state only bans when the harms are too great. Proposition only existed in the extreme. In any other scenario, their case does not stand. Three clashes then. Number one, does this necessitate a ban? Note that this is the most important clash in the round. Insofar as we've proven to you three speeches down why it does not, none of their harms matter insofar as it does not meet the threshold. Secondly, on the enjoyability and the user experience. And third, on development within the gaming industry. On the first clash, did we have to prove massive benefits to justify no ban? Note that it was purely asserted from third proposition because the benefit was purely entertainment and that was sufficient or else proposition needs to argue banning television or anything else that provides you any level any level of entertainment or enjoyment, but also proposition cannot adjudicate whether something is beneficial for a person or not. For some people, like you characterize in your most extreme circumstance, they play thousands of hours, invent, invest thousands of dollars as well in order to feel levels of gratification. For that person, it clearly was very important to the point of, for example, rehabilitation. So proposition could not make blanket swaths and statements that is not beneficial enough because each and every person is diverse and different. What would the harm that constituted their actual metric to ban. Note that after three speakers, it is still unclear what exactly constitutes that said ban. We are lying two things from their speeches. Number one, addiction. Number two, predatory marketing and bad spending. On addiction, we pointed out to you why there was a massive tension that they still could not resolve even in the clarification in third proposition. They said that it's different. You're addicted when you're in the game versus you're addicted before you purchase the game panel. The harm that they argued was addiction and the loss of hours and the loss of 
resources. So it does not matter whether you were addicted prior or after, the harm materializes regardless, which means that they have to defend banning no all games and they could not defend entertainment and enjoyment from other sources of games. But we also explained how this wasn't even a legitimate metric to ban in the first place because being addicted to something is not bad insofar as the substance or the thing you're addicted to is not inherently harmful, which is why we ban, for example, harmful substances, but we don't ban, for example, going to the gym or being a gym junkie because that isn't inherently harmful. Secondly, on predatory marketing and bad spending. Third proposition, literally did not want to hear the reason why we gave moral parallels because they say examples were extrapolating status quo and explaining to you why the metrics to ban is extremely high and you are unable to even meet the bare minimum in society. That things that all constitute predatory marketing are all things that they were unwilling to ban. All they said was regulation is hard. Regulation may be hard, but that does not mean that that's a justification to ban it as well. They say that the state has to regulate, therefore, when harms are too great. They only argued, therefore, in the extreme scenarios where individuals were addicted until they lost their lives or they spent most of their life and ignored their own health or they spent massive amounts of money or went into debt when most individuals are just casual spenders so even if the harm did materialize in their best case they did not have to debate secondly on enjoyability and the user experience we explained structurally why both alternatives they provided were inferior up from first opposition for a play-to-play -play model we explained that number one the high barrier of entry meant that they didn't even get access to enjoy any sort of game if you to pay. But second, that note that once there's a sunk cost, that companies and corporations have no incentive to make the game more enjoyable because you've already spent the $20 and there's no incentive to make it better. For absolutely free games, weak ad-based models, which not only ruin the user experience, by the way, every time you play Candy Crush and a stupid ad pops out, but also has no revenue to actually make it better, which means it stagnates and remains that way. Our profit model was inherent in terms of how we maximize the consumer quality because you constantly need to maintain longevity for you to purchase more things over time. The balancing of incentives was why you wouldn't make the game too ridiculously hard, but you would still make it so that additional purchase were encouraged. Last on development, which saw literally no response, we told you our market collusion destroyed diversity and destroyed development into other things with social implications. Side with all. I thank the speaker for the fine speech. And now to conclude this debate, I call on the proposition reply. Here, here. Uh, okay. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so assuming that everyone can hear me, I'll start my reply shortly. We do not have to ban every single bad thing in the world. That is impossible in a debate about free-to-play games. Rather, our claim was that to that free to play games do far more harm than good. We would rather people turn towards free or one time paid games where the risk of addiction and harm is lower. Both sides can't determine whether players will enjoy FTP games a lot, but we know that at the moment the gaming disease is global. This is a harm that we concretely want to stop. Their first big claim and uh, their push that they spent a lot of time on is that you can't ban this principally, right? But our justification was a risk reward and the scale of addiction. They said Chloe asserted it, but guess what? We gave you this analysis. We told you how this is the majority of things in the world right now being banned because the reward of enjoyability can exist, but it can also be gained elsewhere. But the risk of addiction is too high and it is present in the status quo. Yes, gaming might be cool, but that's not the most important thing in your life, nor is it the only way you can seek this escapism. However, its harms are indeed unique. In addition, the inability to meaningfully regulate means there's a huge risk of harm. They don't get to fiat to claim this unless they really literally want to be like China, the only country that did it. They also tell us we lose out on enjoyability and that's why a ban is better. But if you listen to our arguments, we make gaming better for people. It means people can access the entirety of a game instead of only being able to finish half of a FIFA game. It means you get more accessible, shorter games like Among Us, where companies don't care as much about you playing for a very long time, instead want to make it faster, convenient, and give you immediate enjoyment. Additionally, realize the gaming market is really competitive. There's no market co collusion, like O3 said, because if a company already hired coders, already has an app infrastructure, they're going to develop more apps to appeal to different audiences because this makes them money. Simply banning one category of games doesn't mean there's no longer any sort of market competition. This is a ridiculous assertion without proper mechanization. No. <clears throat> 
And the only push to their entire claim on exploitation is that most people believe uh, don't believe they're a god tier player, so they're not going to spend a whole ton of money, right? But our response is that this isn't the crux of our case, but rather that many people, when they see the game, are incredibly competitive. Yes, we agree, not everyone is a gaming addict, but the point is more nuanced than that. It's that a lot of people, because of the seemingly low cost of microtransaction, are going to engage in them one time, and then two times, and then three times. Maybe it's not to the scale of addiction, but it's that you do it a lot because you lack uh, a perfect autonomy in your side. We gave you this mech at first. You don't start off thinking you'll advance much, but as you play more, your perception of ability changes. Our case isn't the fear of missing out, but about the fact that you have to put in massive investments and time commitment on upside. Note the comparative they pushed us in 03, very late, as the upfront payment is astronomical or companies implement data breaches and sexual images. Sexual images means games are R-rated. This is ridiculous, not part of the debate. Data breaches are, are illegal. Again, ridiculous. The upfront payment may exist, but it's not astronomical. Price competition does exist between all these different companies. They didn't give us a response to this. We actually gave you a mechanism on how we lower price. The most important thing for an op is the accessibility of enjoyable gameplay later on in their speeches. We told you from first, the fact that companies are moving towards ops game model instead of ours should indicate that they make more money from free to play games and that people have to spend, and because people have to spend more money, it's less accessible. They actually encourage people to spend more money, actually locking more gameplay, enjoyable gameplay away from them. These upgrades will likely be significant to your gameplay experience. The info side agrees, all the examples of the debate agrees, and most importantly, the logical incentives agree. Companies want to make money, which means that they're going to try to coerce you to put as much stuff as they can behind a paywall to maximize the chances that you pay. They have an incentive to lock as much of their enjoyable gameplay behind. We told you why the cost of such things add up I'm just spending and add totals more. I think we take down the vast majority of their case, but also note the unique uh, points that they didn't respond to. They didn't respond to both the incentive and capability to lower price in my speech. The point is the games are already cheaper on our side. We lower them even further because you have the ability and mechanism to do so. The point isn't that ads are just going to ruin the game on our side. The point is that ads may be a minor inconvenience, but the fact that 90% of the game is locked behind a paywall is probably a greater inconvenience on opposition side in terms of enjoyability. Finally, and very quickly, just talking about game developer actions. My second split, Unresponder 2, was short, but I gave you the weighing. Obligating companies to constantly churn out more upgrades means that workers are going to be facing crunch. This is about ethical supply chains like we care about anywhere else. Just because Malaysia isn't literate on game supply debate doesn't mean that they can wash away this harm. We respond to their claim on collusion, but we think you do have to care about these vulnerable individuals behind the game. The cost of free to play games is not non-existent. The cost of a free game is indeed your autonomy and your enjoyability. I thank the speaker for the fine speech and all the debaters for what was a very, very fine, excellent round. Um, at this point, the debate has concluded.